In this tutorial, we'll look at how we perform clip timing within Nuke. So this might include reading a portion of a clip, freeze framing, shifting the sync of a clip, making a clip play backwards, or even retiming a clip so that it plays at different speeds or even variable speeds during the course of its uh, playback. In this exercise, we'll take a closer look at a familiar node, which is the read node. Um, as you can see, I have a sample of a uh, of a clip already loaded into the uh, into the script with a re via a read node, um, and essentially this is a simple graphical clip which essentially contains a um, a, a numeric uh, element which in increments by one number every one frame. It's a 100 frame duration clip, so essentially it counts up from one to 100 over the course of its duration. So this should make any temporal changes that we make during this exercise easy to follow. So I'm going to start by double clicking the clip just to bring open the read node into uh, the properties panel. And if we just move to frame 1 so that we're actually looking at the very first frame of this particular clip's timeline. Now in the read no properties we can see a couple of things in here which allude to uh, to controlling the uh, the frame of the clip this is the one i want to focus on at the moment the frame range so let's make a little adjustment to this let's tell it to start at frame 20 and end at frame 80 we can already see a change in the actual representation of the clip even though we're on frame 1 on the timeline we can see now that we're actually displaying number 20 which means that we're actually looking at frame 20 of this particular clip uh, but this is now at position frame 1 on the global timeline so if we set this plane now we can see what happens so essentially what's happening here is that the uh, is that the clip is pausing until the timeline reaches frame 20 after which it starts to count up to a point of 80 after which it then pauses again until it reaches frame 100 which is the end of the global timeline I'll just stop this so effectively Nuke is ignoring the first 20 frames and the last 20 frames of the clip um, and, the, and the reason why we're, we're, we're getting this hold element at the beginning and again at the end is down to the, this operation here. This is the before operation. If we, just, if we just click on it, we can see that this is what we're telling uh, Nuke to do with the, uh, with the clip before we reach the, uh, the number 20. And in this case, what we do with it after we reach the number 80. And we do have some options again with these. Uh, we'll we'll look at these with the beginning option. So we'll set the first one to loop, and we'll set it plain again. So we can see that now Nuke is looping around the uh, the range of the frame twenty to to twenty to eighty. So it's counting its way down, and then it's going back up till it reaches eighty, and then it pauses. It goes back round to the beginning. We're then looping back round. So next, let's now change this to our next operator, which is bounce, and we'll set it going again. So this is essentially a ping pong operation, which is causing the clip to play backwards until it reaches frame 20. After this, it then bounces and plays forwards until it reaches the frame 80, then bounces back and plays backwards until it reaches frame 20, and so on and so forth. So let's just stop this and we'll move on to the next one, which is black. So again, if we play this, then what we should see is the first 20 frames of the clip being shown as pure black. Then the clip begins to play from frame 20 until it reaches frame 80 and then holds at frame 80 and of course if I set the end operation also to black then what we'll see is that the clip blacks out from frame 80 as well so we, we've essentially got the first 20 frames and the last 20 frames being displayed as black and the counting is just taking place between frames 20 and 80 So all the same operations that we were looking at within the uh, within the before operation are also in the after operation. So uh, so feel free to experiment with those and see the effects of those on the global timeline. Now, if we want to create a freeze frame effect, we use a node called the frame hold node. 
So if we just take a look at this script, it's kind of basically where we carried off uh, previously. Uh, it's got the same clip in here, which uh, with, with the numeric uh, graphic, which which uh, in, it, which uh, increments up by one integer every uh, every one frame over a course of 100 frames, which is the duration of the clip. Um, so what we'll do in this particular case is we'll just click on the clip, and we'll add a frame node, a frame hold node. So I'll just type that in. To, uh, to to bring it up into the into the tab, and this is now in situ after the clip. And we can see that this node is very simple. It just has two properties, um, and we'll look at each during the course of this short exercise. So to help us look at what's happening here a little bit easier, I'm just going to connect uh, the the read node up via the second port into the viewer, so we can toddle between the two and therefore we'll be able to see the difference on the effect uh, more, more, more easily. So, let's start by looking at the first frame node. Essentially what this does is this allows us to freeze the frame on a particular, on a particular frame. So say for example I, I set this to a number 10 and we look at the viewer through, through port 1. We can now see that if I play this clip then we have indeed frozen the frame onto onto frame 10. If I just hit number one to view the uh, to, to to view the viewer through uh, oops number two to view the viewer through the second port, we can see this is actually the clip running uh, with uh, without the frame old, and we can see that the clip's just running normally. Back to the freeze frame, and we can see now that the clip uh, the clip is actually frozen on frame 10. And this is important, and this is typically what you would do to uh, if you wanted basically to create a uh, a still frame within uh, within a, a, a composition in order to uh, in order to do something like rotoscope or patch or uh, or something like that. Then this is typically how you would do it. You wouldn't you wouldn't reintroduce an instance of the clip or take it into Photoshop and create a still from it. This is a very easy and practical way that you would generate a freeze frame. So I'll just stop this now and we'll just look at what the increment property does. So I'm just going to set the first frame back to zero and I'm going to set the increment value to five. So we'll just come again, come back to the first frame and I'll set it going. Okay. So what's actually happening here is uh, an increment effect whereby the clip is holding on a single frame for a, for, a, for a duration of five frames, after which it jumps. If I just use the nudge one frame at a time button, we can see that we're on frame five. One, two, three, four, and ten. One, two, three, four, and fifteen. So we're telling it here to increment by, by a value of five every five frames. So we might use this typically to create uh, to create a a, um, a stuttering effect or to create a stop motion where we wouldn't want to actually see a clip. Uh, in, in its entirety, we'd want to actually make it look as if it's uh, as if it's running in a slightly different way. So this is typically how we might go about that. So in essence, this is it. This is the fr this is the frame hold node, a very simple node used for creating uh, incremental changes uh, based on a numeric that we set, or by creating freeze frame, which is by far the most common use for the node. Now what if we want to change the sync of a clip? Moving it from uh, left to right in the timeline so it starts and ends in a different place. Now Newt doesn't have a clip editor uh, like a layer based uh, compositing program or a video editing application. So instead of this we use the time offset node. So let's add a time offset node. So again I've selected my clip and I'll just type it in until it appears. And it, here is the time offset node now embedded between the clip and the viewer, and we can see that this is equally equally simple in terms of in terms of the number of properties and the and the way in which it's operated as the previous frame hold node. In fact, in this case, we only we only really dealing with one property and one uh, on or off option, which we which we control via this checkbox, and we'll come on to this in a second. But first of all, let's take a look at what's happening with the time offset. Essentially we use this by putting in a numeric value 
and whatever we put in here will either shift the clip on its own timeline either to the left or the right within the global timeline so to demonstrate that we can see that at the moment we're on frame one of the of the clip and we're on frame one of the global timeline so if I just change this to say to minus nine you can see now that I'm still on frame one of the global timeline but now we're looking at frame 10 of the clip we've essentially shifted the whole clip we haven't shortened or lengthened the clip what we've done is we've shifted the whole thing by 10 frames to the left so what will happen now is that the clip will play normally but it will play from from frame 10 and when it gets to frame 100 as we just saw here it gets to frame 100 it runs out of frames and so it just holds until we get to the end of the global timeline so we start from the, the frame 10 based on the fact that I've actually moved this uh, 10 frames to the uh, to the left. The fact that it's minus 9 takes into account that we're actually starting on frame 0 and frame 0 is actually counted so 0 counts as 1 so minus 9 is actually moving at 10 frames to the left. So similarly if I remove the minus so we're now, uh, now so we're now in plus values then we don't see anything at the, at the at the front of the of the clip straight away. We just set it playing. We can see the effects of this. So what's actually happening is that because we've set this to start at uh, if you like ten frames forward, we've moved the whole clip ten frames to the right. So the frames effectively holding on frame one until the playhead reaches frame ten after which it now begins to play at normal speed until it gets to the end of the global timeline and obviously because we've actually slid the clip we've actually slid the clip 10 frames to the to the right now then the global timeline is only 100 frames so we actually get to the the end of the of the global timeline but we've still got 10 frames um, of the of the actual clip at the end of this which are now not getting displayed they've been clipped off by the duration of the global timeline and we can also use this node to actually reverse uh, a clip so I'm just going to set this back to frame 1 and I'm going to set my time offset back to 0 and this time I'm going to check the reverse input button and this does exactly what you'd expect you can see that it's now jumped from frame 1 to frame 100 so if I set this playing now you can see that this is now playing in reverse so the, so the reverse input is very simple it's how we basically make a clip play backwards and the same rules would apply as before so if I if I come to um, frame 1 and I set this to minus 9 with the reverse uh, selected we can see that it's actually it's actually taken off the first 10 frames of the clip so it's actually going to start playing from the from from that particular point and because it's playing backwards then it's actually removing the last 10 frames of the clip because it's all been reversed so we get to the we get to the end of the process here at frame at frame 1 which is frame 90 and then it just holds on that point until we get to the end of the global timeline so that's the uh, that's the time offset node it's used to uh, to sync a clip so we can slide it either to the left or to the right within the global timeline and we can also use it to uh, make a clip play in reverse so so far we've looked at frame ranges reversing and shifting the sync of a clip however none of these have actually changed the timing of the clip you can see that I've got a composition open again which is basically where we were before um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to select my clip and I'm going to add a retime node and again that sits in between the clip and the uh, and the viewer and we can see that with the retime node selected that we've got a few properties here that we need to take a look at so this node allows us to change the timing of the clip albeit with quite simple interpolation capabilities and effectively it can perform frame duplication or frame averaging which is a form of blending the frames together which allows us to play clips either quicker than they should be uh, naturally played or slower um, it is, the frame duplication and frame averaging process is, is more limited than some of the optical flow uh, interpolations uh, but they use different nodes and we will approach those in, in, in other slightly more advanced tutorials so the retime node essentially has two ways of changing speed um, and we can see these in the properties the first and the obvious one is the speed property um, so we'll start with this and we'll set this to 0.5 and we'll just see what happens when we play the clip
OK, so hopefully we can see what's going on here. Essentially the clip's playing normally along the timeline, but when we get to frame 100 of the global timeline, we've only actually reached frame 50 of our clip, which essentially means that the clip is playing at half its normal speed. Now if we just take a look at what's going on here, I'm going to use the, the nudge one frame button at a time so we can actually see what's going on. If I press this, you see nothing happens. We press it again, two, nothing happens, three, nothing happens, four, nothing happens, five, etc. So this is called double print. Every frame of the clip now occupies two frames of the global timeline. So similarly, if I set this to 0 0.3333 in effectively a third, then what we would also expect now is that this will it will now occupy every three pre three frames of the global timeline. So click, click, two, click, click, three, click, click, four, etc. And this is called triple print. So that is the principle of frame duplication. If we just set this now, we'll go in the opposite direction. So let's just set this speed to two. Okay. So if I set this plane now, we can see that the opposite effect is achieved. Essentially, we get to frame 50 of the global timeline and we've now run out of frames on our actual clip. We can also see the ghost of two numbers coming together. So on frame 50, we can actually see the ghost of numbers 99 and 100. So effectively 100 laid over the top of 99. And this is frame averaging. So let's look at what's going on on the actual timeline. So I'm going to come back to the first frame. Um, and just so we can see this a little bit clearer, I'm just going to, to turn, the, turn the filter off and set this from box to nearest. And I will come back to the filter and explain what's going on with this in a second. So let's just move one frame at a time through the timeline and see what's happening. So we can see effectively the opposite effect of frame duplication. What's actually happening now is that we're seeing every other clip of the, fr of the or every other frame of the clip on every frame of the global timeline. So effectively it's ad it's showing us every alternate frame and this is how it's giving us the, the, the speed up in time so that it's able to show us a clip running at twice its normal speed. And the way that it actually softens this in terms of the way that we see it is by way of the blend, the, the frame averaging process, which when set to box we actually see this blending going on between the two, uh, between the two frames of the image. I'm just going to come into this a little bit so we can see it a bit closer. This is controlled by the property inside the uh, the retime node called the shutter. So if I just start to drag this shutter to the left, we can see that what I'm actually doing is diminishing the uh, the the frame averaging. So I'm taking out that averaging process, and eventually, when I come to this end, then I have the same effect as when I set this to nearest. I have the same effect. I have no blending of the image so we still move forward at, at alternate frames uh, so uh, but we don't have any averaging going on so that's effectively the same as setting that to nearest so set to box the shutter controls the quality of the blend within the frame averaging uh, process so I did say that there were two ways of controlling this so I'm just going to set the speed back to one and the other way of controlling this is to actually use the input and the output ranges. So to do this I have to enable the input and the output ranges by hitting the checkbox next to the adjacent one. And let's just change this a little bit. So let's set the input range from 1 to 50 and we'll leave the output range at its default 1 to 100. Okay, and we can see here already that something, uh, something behind the scenes has happened. It's automatically shifted the speed, I'd set it to 1, it's actually sh shifted it back to 0 0.5. So if I play the clip, we can see that we're back to where we were at the beginning of this exercise when we set the, when we set the speed to 0 0.5. We can see that it's printing every alternate frame of the, of the clip, or should I say it's printing the clip on two frames of the global timeline, which is giving us the, the half speed. So the sim a similar effect would be achieved if I set the input range from 1 to 100 frames and the output range from 1 to 50. So effectively now the clip will now be running at twice the speed and we'll see the frame averaging process inside the inside the clip again. And again we can see that the uh, that the, the node 
property has again uh, changed the speed to two behind the scenes based on that. So this is a we two ways in which we can control the, uh, the 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 retiming. So we've essentially used this to speed up the clip and slow down the clip. So we're, this is the first time that we've really looked at actually retiming a clip, making it play faster or slower than it was intended to be. But what if we wanted to uh, to to create a, a system of variable time within within a clip. In other words, that the clip may be slowed up or speeded down during its playback. Well, we do this also within the re within the retime node. I'm just going to set this back to its default property. So uh, so again, our inputs are reading from one to one hundred, both on the clip and on the global timeline, and our speed is set to one. Now we actually control the the. The, the, the speed of the clip on a variable basis from within the time warp tab of the node. So when we click this, this is essentially a, a histogram with a, a curve that we can adjust. And those adjustments uh, essentially allow us to perform variable speed changes over the length of the shot. So to do this, I'm, I'm, I'm effectively going to swap out my clip for a, a, another clip so we can actually see the effect of this change a little bit easier. So I'm just going to bring in this clip um, and we'll just move that out of the way and connect and connect our retime node up to this. In fact, I can actually delete that numeric now, and we'll take a look at this. So, if I just play this out now, uh, give it a couple of goes to uh, to fully cache, and we can see what we've got. We've got this little boy uh, walking across this green screen area. So, before we start making any changes to this, we just need to spend a little a little. Um, while just understanding uh, the the nature of the histogram. So we have two points at the moment. We have this point down here at axis 0, 0, which is essentially equates to the start of the clip. We have this point up here at point 1, 1, which essentially equates to the end of the clip. And we have a linear path, a straight line in between the two. And this signifies that no speed changes have been made. The, the timing of the clip starts at the beginning, ends at the end, and moves in a linear way through. So we have no, this is typically what we would expect a clip to look like at its beginning when no time changes have been made. Now we make time changes on here by adjusting the curve. So to do this, if I just come over the, um, and place my cursor over the, uh, over the curve point, and I'm just moving into somewhere near the center of the point. Now if I hold down Control and Alt now and click on the, uh, on the line, and while I've still got Control and Alt selected, if I now just pull this down into this area, we can now look at what we've done to the timing. So essentially, where our bar is more horizontal than vertical, flatter, then we would expect the, mo the movement of the clip to be playing slower than it was intended. And where the clip is steeper, more vertical, then we would expect the clip to be playing faster. So if we set this at the beginning and then clip play this through, we will need to let it go a couple of times in order to load fully into the cache. We can see exactly that effect in the timing of the clip. So we can see the boy walking slowly and we can see it gradually it gradually assumes normal speed and then accelerates into a faster speed than, than normal. And that is the direct relationship of this of this type of curve on the clip. So similarly, if I get the clip and uh, and again, if I just hold Control and Alt and drag it up into this area, now we've got the opposite effect. We've essentially got created a situation where the clip starts quickly, because the the line is steeper, and then it tails off into much slower than it was intended. So, and again, we're seeing the effect of that on the clip. We start we see that the little boy is walking very quickly initially, and then we slow down into the into this slow motion. And if we look closely at the motion blur on the legs there, we can actually see uh, the frame averaging process taking place there within the, uh, within the actual image. Now we can also uh, use the, um, this, uh, this approach to retime the image in a linear way. So I'm just going to select my point that I created before and delete it just by highlighting it as the delete button so we're back to a linear path. So if I wanted, for example, to make this clip play uh, at a at a different speed, let's say, for example, that I take my point, and I'm just gonna I, I'm just gonna slide this whole thing across to around about 0.5 of this uh, of the of this timeline, so around about there. So if we play this now, we can see now that I'm I'm essentially making the clip play at twice its speed. 
so the clip plays twice as quickly as it was intended until we get to frame 50 and then it holds. So that was exactly the same effect as what we did in the basic retime settings when we set the speed to twice. And I'll just undo that and I'll do the same effect with the beginning point. Again, if I drag this up to round about 0.5 um, and play it again, then I've effectively halved the speed of the clip by pulling the pulling pulling it down so it's now running at half the speed. So I can I can exact linear changes on on this as well as uh, as well as variable speed changes. Okay, and again I'll just hit control Z to take us back to the default position. Now I just want to finish this off by looking at how the basic retime function and the time warp curve uh, work together. So again, I'll just hit the revert button just to make absolutely sure this is back to its default settings. Uh, the revert button sets it back to the uh, to the properties that uh, that the uh, node was at when the uh, when the script was last opened. And because I've created this script from scratch, then uh, then this is uh, basically how the node would be if for, if I took it out of the node uh, library for the first time. So let's just go back to the retime node and make a quick change inside here. So let's set the speed simply to two. So we know what we know what to expect here. The clip the clip plays at twice its normal speed until it gets to frame 50 when it runs out of frames, and then it just holds until we get to the end of the global timeline. So now let's flip back to the time warp histogram and add in a point. So again, I'm just going to click in, click in here, click to make a point. And then, while I've still got Control and Alt selected, I'll just drag this up. Okay. Now, just to make this a little bit easier to see, I'm just going to change this to a linear interpolation rather than a curved inter in interpolation. So I'm just going to right-click on this. This might go outside of the screen capture. Uh, unfortunately, there's nothing I can do about this. So I'm just going to come down to interpolation. You can maybe just be able to see the word linear. So I've set this to linear, which means now that there's no gradual phase between the quick and the slow. We get to that point moving faster than normal speed, and then we immediately change to slower normal speed. And it should just make it a little bit easier for us to see this interpolation taking place. Okay. So the point of this is to actually interrogate what is that, what what this point here, what this point here currently means for us, what the value of this current of this point is at the moment, given that we changed the speed in the retime to two. So essentially, because we changed it in that way, this point here, rather than this being the end of the clip, this now equates to frame 50 of the clip. So if we play this out now, we can see this. We can see the variable speed change, but we can also see that our 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 initial speed change of doubling up the speed of the clip has still been incorporated into it. So the clip is still playing at twice the speed, even though our variable speed change has been applied to it. So this variable speed change that we've applied inside the time warp node is relative to any retiming that we've done within the basic settings. So this is the essence of the retime node, used to create very popular effects such as bullet time and ultra slow motion or ultra speed ups, uh, which we see in very popular films such as The Matrix and Crouching Tiger.